And uh, so what I'm talking about is uh, something that we've been thinking about uh, with Don Morolf at UCSB. And it's really inspired uh, by uh, some recent and some not so recent developments in quantum gravity. Uh, so these are pictures that I've stolen from various people's papers without permission. Uh, which you might recognize some of them. So one is something we've already heard uh, quite a lot about this week from, so this is the, uh, what Ahmed was talking about earlier uh, today, and it's also very similar to pictures that were drawn by uh, Jeff and Douglas and Steve in their talks. And this is the development of discovering that we can recover uh, the page curve of semi-classical, uh, the page curve of black hole evaporation from a semi-classical calculation, which was surprising. And it's been beautifully emphasized by uh, the authors I've mentioned and others that, uh, that this is intimately related to having topologies in quantum gravity that uh, are joining together systems that we thought were independent and different things. Uh, and this is very similar as well to work, uh, slightly earlier work, in particular by Saad Schenker and Stanford, that uh, demonstrated that JT gravity has this beautiful property that uh, if you include the same sorts of things, where you have multiple separate asymptotically ADS boundaries, you include topologies, there's a description of this not as a single CFT dual, but as an ensemble of, of theories that live on the boundary. Uh, and the pictures, of course, look very similar. And this picture up here is, in fact, topologically the same as this picture, drawn by Coleman in 1988 uh, in a slightly different context. Uh, so he was imagining we're living in this large universe on the left-hand side. Uh, and there are perhaps solutions or configurations in the path integral where a little baby universe can split off and perhaps rejoin at some other point in space-time. And he was saying that, uh, that the result is that the couplings in this large universe are effectively random. And the reason for that is that they're entangled with some Hilbert space of closed universes. Uh, and this is a paper from the same year by Giddings and Strominger, uh, where the figure caption here says, a topologically non-trivial process involving joining and splitting universes. And these pictures all look very similar. And um, we found this very inspiring. And we've tried to bring a lot of these ideas together. And uh, I hope that we've, we've sort of given a more unified picture of all of these things. And hopefully, we'll uh, contribute to the understanding of of all of these. Um, I just give some credits, first of all, that um, a lot of this has been really helped by conversations with Jeff and with Xi Dong and uh, Steve Giddings in Santa Barbara. So um, should we, some credit go to them. Uh, OK, so what am I going to talk about? Um, for this first part, I'm going to try and go relatively slowly uh, and talk about the sort of, at a very general setting, the, the way we want to think about this problem and setting up how we want to think about uh, this Hilbert space of baby universes and, in general, how to deal with ADS-CFT in a context with semi-classical gravity, but these Euclidean wormholes. Um, and an example that we found very edifying to understand some of the key new features, some of which are really qualitatively uh, new and, I think, change our understanding of a lot of things. Um, it was very useful to use a, a very simple example. actually. Douglas described the model he talked about as very simple. Um, and I think we need a new superlative, because this is a really stupid model. But nonetheless, it's, it's far more beautiful what comes out than it only has, has any right to be. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this. And then probably down here, I'm going to end up accelerating, because there's lots of exciting things I want to say. And, uh, and I'll just. Say them quickly, and hopefully I can have conversations with many of you over the next uh, hours, days, and months. Uh, so OK. Let's uh, get started then with anything else I wanted to say. OK, okay so let's think about um, ADS-CFT, or a just ADS gravity with wormholes. So our ingredients are we going to have some of a gravitational effective field theory with some fields phi, which includes a metric, possibly, uh, with some action. and 
Uh, this has some admissible set of boundary conditions, um, which are labeled by some sources, which will include an asymptotic boundary metric. Um, and I'll decide that it'll be a, the sources will label a, a connected boundary metric. And uh, the, the most general thing I can compute is a path integral over all possible metrics with the boundary conditions labeled by these, these J. Uh, and OK, so here's a, here's a configuration that might appear in the path integral. These red circles are some, um, are some asymptotically ADS boundaries. So a nice model to have in mind here is, um, is the JT gravity model. And you can think of each of these as, uh, as like a, a boundary with regularized length beta. So J here stands for just the regularized length beta in that model. But more generally, it could stand for anything. And I'm going to write this path integral. This is just notation for now very suggestively, like this. Okay. And this, if I didn't have these funny brackets and I just had one of these Zs, this would be the sort of standard GKPW dictionary for ADS CFT. The partition function of some CFT uh, is equal to some path integral over geometries. Say. Okay. Uh, but now, the natural interpretation that we, want to, that we might want to assign to this, if we're lucky, uh, is not a single CFT. Uh, but an ensemble. Because if I have multiple boundaries and I allow for configurations like this, unless there is a miracle of cancellation, uh, the, 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 sort of, the amplitude with several boundaries won't just be a product of the amplitude of the individual boundaries. Uh, so um, an interpretation we might try is that this z is a CFT partition function, but there's this extra angle brackets that involve an ensemble. And these z of j's, because there's a load of different theories we're averaging over, uh, these z's are random variables that we have to uh, take some average of. And this was um, if the example of Sarah Schenker and Stanford really showed explicitly what this ensemble looked like in the context of JT gravity. And um, this is my chance to advertise some other work in progress where uh, we've made a lot of steps towards showing that something similar is true. We don't understand anything like as much detail as these guys, but. If you're interested in 3D pure gravity, then please ask me uh, at some point. Um, OK, so a natural question here is, is to ask what's the bulk description of a single element of this ensemble? OK, uh, so what do you want to say? OK, so following uh, Coleman in 88 uh, and others, we'd like to uh, start off by trying to understand this path integral uh, in a Hilbert space interpretation. So what do we do with a Hilbert space? We just slice our path integral open in two, and we say there should be some Hilbert space, a set of intermediate states between the two. The stuff on the bottom is, uh, is a ket preparing some state, and the stuff on the top is a bra, and we're taking the overlap. Um, and these intermediate states, at the moment, I'm going to make this cut so that it doesn't intersect any of the asymptotically ADS boundaries. So this is going to be some uh, Hilbert space of closed universes. Okay, uh, so if we just try to sort of quantize this directly on the geometry, um, this has the usual sort of challenges that are very familiar in cosmology. Uh, there's stiff invariance, we have to do some gauge fixing, there's a wheel de equation and so forth, and that's particularly bad here because universes can split and join, and this makes life sort of complicated. But the fact that we have now asymptotically ADS boundary conditions means we have a, a way to sidestep this whole problem. We're going to cheat. Um, our solution is that there are a nice set of states. We just define this set of states at the asymptotic past. So these are, it's like a, yeah, I define my initial state by the set of boundaries. So uh, the set of boundaries in the past, I stick them in a ket. The set of boundaries in the future, I stick them in a bra. And I call this, so this here would be z of j3, I think it was labeled last time. And that would be a state in this, what I'll call HBU, the Hilbert space of baby universes, of closed universes. So this describes some set of states. Are you uh, good, thanks. Um, yeah, so for simplicity, you can think of all these things being in Euclidean signature. Uh, but this is something more general. I can imagine that my boundary conditions involve some, uh, some schwinger keldish type path with Lorentzian evolution. And the, the geometries may have some Euclidean section preparing states and Lorentzian sections evolving. Uh, so this, while it looks uh, Euclidean, uh, would include something like uh, preparing a black hole and 
evolving it, collecting radiation, and the sort of... Um, uh, so, in particular, something like the recent calculations of page curves and coupling to an auxiliary system could be described by, by uh, a sum of amplitudes like this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Um, okay, and... Uh, but these states, they're, of course, not orthogonal. We know what the inner product should be. Uh, you just take the bra and the ket, and the amplitude is the inner product of the bra and the ket. Uh, there's a star to CBT conjugation. This is not very important, but um, uh, okay. So this is the definition of the inner product. Uh, so for the dual point of view, if we want to interpret uh, this thing uh, as an average in our ensemble of theories, this is uh, taking the inner product as the covariance matrix of random variables, which is a very standard thing to do in probability. Uh, we're going to just make one assumption here, uh, which is that this Euclidean path integral is reflection positive, which is basically the statement that this inner product is positive semi-definite. This is the only thing we're going to, sort of, key ingredient we're going to, to impose on our path integral. Uh, so in particular, if I take the norm of a state, that norm should be non-negative. OK. Um, so I've just described some particular set of states. It's now obvious how I describe, I can now have sums of these states with whatever coefficients I like. Um, and I can actually sort of follow a standard recipe to construct the Hilbert space. Thank you. Is this inner product very precise, or are we being sort of uh, uh, cartoon here? Because it seems like you can't put an arbitrary cat and an arbitrary ground. So the inner product is referring to an arbitrary cat and a ground. Whereas here, you've got a very particular slicing. Um, so the point of this inner product was I didn't care about the slicing. Um, it, it's, the inner product is exactly as, I mean, so this is the definition, so it's exactly as well defined as the path integral, the Euclidean path integrals I started with. So, okay, that, that path integral may be an asymptotic series or something, uh, but... Would this sum over the number of components? Um, so, okay, I'm, I, I define, for these special states, I define the inner product like this, and then if I take uh, linear combinations of these, I I extend the definition of my inner product by linearity. Okay. Is that? So how do you decide what street term what path here? You could have drawn a blue line that. Indeed. And I can quantize in any direction. And so that means that any particular amplitude will have many different Hilbert space interpretations. But this is exactly the same as quantum field theory. I can quantize <coughs> in with whatever time I like, and I should get the same answer. So, yeah, so I've, so I've picked some very special choice of states, and I've defined the inner product between two of those special states. I then can also define an inner product on linear combinations of those uh, special states by just, by linearity. So that's how I define it on sums of these states, which I can think of as, as sort of formal polynomials in this Z of J. That's all I've done so far. Uh, uh, it's not actually an inner product at the moment. Uh, ask the question after this slide. <laughs> um, so, okay. What I'm going to do, I, so I have these special states. I can take linear combinations of these states. I have an inner product on these states, which is positive semi-definite. Um, and now I can use this to define a Hilbert space. So, uh, that is just, uh, it's the completion. This is something that is familiar from quantum field theory as from the Osterwald de Schrader construction, where I, you know, you, so you define the physical, this Hilbert space baby universe as equivalent classes of Cauchy sequences and so forth. And as long as I started with something that was at least almost an inner product, which means it needs to only be positive semi-definite, not positive definite, which was my only assumption, then you end up with a really a Hilbert space. So, Daniel, what was your question? <laughs> Daniel, uh, no. So, okay, so this is exactly the next slide. Yeah. Um, okay, I comment. Uh, so, this construction, one of the aspects of this construction is that it throws out null states. So, when I do this completion, there could be some polynomial or, or uh, sort of infinite series of states like this that turns out to have exactly zero overlap with every other state. 
And this construction says that that is just the zero state. So there may be some linear combinations of these states that are zero. And this, okay, it might seem like a sort of little technicality, but this is the central point of the whole thing. So what this tells me is that I have these sorts of states. I want to say that these create some sort of semi-classically distinguishable different universes. And then I take some inner product, uh, sorry, some um, superposition of many different states of, in, uh, of universes that look semi-classically distinct. And for some reason, okay, that reason is diffeomorphism invariance appropriately souped up. Uh, these states, this, this superposition turns out to be zero. These states are not linearly independent. So there are these non-perturbative effects, joining and splitting of baby universes um, that, uh, that truncate the Hilbert space. And it's an enormous truncation of the Hilbert space. And we'll see in the example uh, why that works. So there is one example of this that is familiar, but certainly not in this language. So uh, in the Fermafield double state, OK, so this is not precisely in the language I've understood, but uh, I've been describing, but hopefully the analogy is close enough. In the uh, Thermofield double state, I can describe the states of the, just the gravitational theory, which is the, the, the state of the Einstein-Rosen bridge is one state. And I know from sort of holographic duality, I should be able to write this as the Thermofield double state, which is a superposition of energy eigenstates, which are disconnected states, something on the left, something on the right. None of these states look like they have an Einstein-Rosen bridge. These things look semi-classically completely distinct, but nonetheless, they're equal. Why are they equal? They're equal because of uh, gauge invariance, because of diffeomorphism invariance. The wheelie DeWitt equation, if you like. Uh, so this is very similar. Um, we revisited a, a paper of Daniel from a couple of years ago that was talking about something very similar in the context of bulk observables uh, and some very uh, similar structures there. So I encourage you to go and uh, reread that paper. And we learned a lot from that. OK, um, good. I'll just pause in case there are other questions. OK, so we've got the Hilbert space. What else do we have? We have operators on that Hilbert space. So here's a definition of an operator. I start with some in state, which is perhaps one of these special states defined by some past boundary conditions, and I have some out state. I can define an operator by just saying I integrate over all possible geometries where I, some state comes in, I throw in an extra boundary that has to be there in the path integral, and then some stuff comes out. OK. Um, and the thing I can throw in is just any sort of CFT object, a partition function, so like a Z of beta in the JT gravity. And here's the definition of this operator. Uh, so in the, in the sort of approximation where baby universes don't really split and join very often, I can think of this as like it's a, the, either the creation of a baby universe or the annihilation of a complex conjugate baby universe. Uh, but this approximation that these things are free is uh, these extra dot, dot, dots that take into account the fact that uni universes can split and join means that this description as creation and annihilation operators is just not useful. Um, OK, and we'll see when that happens. Um, OK, so I told you that there's this gauge invariance. Um, so you can check that these operators are actually well-defined on the baby universe Hilbert space. So when I take this quotient and throw out the null states, uh, that this operator is 0 on the null states. So that's straightforward. They also, they all commute. So that means if I insert two of these operators, there's nothing in the path integral that tells me what order they're in. Uh, so so it, this is, when I insert this operator, it means I'm, I'm creating a new boundary condition which has all the normal things in ADS-CFT with a holographic normalization and so forth to make it finite. So this is really the, okay, so you could take this as a definition that if I took one of my special states of Zs as the in state, another special state of Zs as the out state with this operator, then what I'm just computing is something with some, some boundaries in the future, some boundaries in the past, 
and some boundaries here. And whether I call them bras, cats, or operators, it doesn't actually matter in the end. And that's sort of why this commutation happens. It doesn't care whether it's in the past or the future or an operator. But good. OK. Um, right. Um, so I have some operators on the baby universe that all commute. We all like quantum mechanics. We know what to do when we have a load of commuting operators. We find some simultaneous eigenstates, which I will call alpha. So this Z operator on, on these eigenstates, I know exists, has some eigenvalue, Z alpha. So is it clear that your Z hat operator is, is invariant under your gauge symmetry? Yeah, this was this first thing I was saying as well defined on the Hilbert space. You can just check, because you can put this operator in the bra instead of the ket, if you have a null state, by definition, um, it act has zero matrix elements in that state. We can, that's probably a bit quick. But. Uh, how am I doing for time? OK. Um, so uh, these states alpha, first of all, they're unique for given eigenvalues. If I specify the eigenvalue of every z of j, then we could show that these states uh, are uniquely defined by their eigenvalues. They're all orthogonal to one another because they're commuting operators. They're actually complete in the baby universe Hilbert space. Um, and finally, they all overlap with the, the no boundary state. So there's a special state, the hartle hawking state, where I put no boundaries in the past. Uh, so this means that these alphas are actually a basis for the baby universe Hilbert space. OK, what's next? How should we interpret these? This is an orthonormal basis of the baby universe Hilbert space. And every one of these elements has definite values for every one of these sort of CFT objects. So we should interpret these as the partition functions in some specific theory, some member of the ensemble. So that means that the ensemble is classified by the spectrum of this operator. And the spectrum of this operator precisely gives us the set of observables in each member of the ensemble. The probability of any particular theory uh, in the original ensemble I described is given by its overlap with a hartle hawking state, which is positive and less than one. Uh, and then the expectation value, this, this, the path integral with n boundaries, uh, is given by the sum over the eigenvalues in the alpha states times the overlap with the alpha states. You just get this by inserting complete sets of states. So automatically, I just gave you a Euclidean path integral that was reflection positive. I didn't give you anything else. This means that automatically that path integral has an interpretation as a classical ensemble with pos positive real probabilities. And each member of that ensemble has a, a complicated but nonetheless complete description in effective field theory. I describe it as a state of all these states defined purely with the effective field theory. No high energy stuff needed. So it's like having there's an initial conditions problem in ADS here. So, so I included this hartle hawking state. But uh, so implicitly in all the discussions that people have been doing, in all the calculations that Douglas, Jeff, Ahmed talked about, and, uh, and before, we were making an implicit choice. And that implicit choice was that we were putting everything, the initial state of the closed universes, in the hartle hawking state with no boundaries. That was not the only choice we could make. We could have chosen to put the baby universes in one of these special states. Then, no disorder, single answer, one theory. OK, how, how, how am I doing for time? Badly, probably. I have time. How much time? OK. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so some of the aspects of this. In particular, this large gauge invariance, you may not believe me yet that it's there, how dramatic it is, um, are not so obvious. But hopefully, some of that will become clearer in example. But if there are any questions about the general setup, it's a good time. Awesome. Everyone's following. OK. Uh, yeah, actually, this is Douglas's, what Douglas called my model uh, in his talk. So he, he made the crudest possible approximation at some point of JT gravity, where he said, let's just um, we have, uh, let's just forget about the metrics and the dilettons, and we'll only include the Euler character term. The I model is going to really take that to the extreme, and I'm going to say that I really have a, a completely topological theory of 2D gravity, which means I don't have any metric whatsoever. And my definition of my path integral 
uh, is to be uh, just a sum over topological surfaces, oriented topological surfaces. And there's an action, which is the Euler character. And that's the only local action I can write down here. Local is a bit tricky when there's no metric. Local means here that if I cut things and glue things together, then the action is invariant. And this is basically everything I can write down. OK, so what are the boundary conditions in my model so far? Basically, I can have circular boundaries. That's all I've got. Uh, and a convention, I basically add a counter term, if you like, to the boundaries so that they, these don't count towards chi. So chi sums up basically the number of handles and doesn't count the boundaries. This is my choice. You'll see why I made it later. OK, so for example, this, uh, the z cubed amplitude is the sum over all geometries with three boundaries. And a geometry is just some surface that has three circular boundaries. So here's one contribution. Uh, this piece here is a disk. It gives me e to the its parameter s0. Uh, and this has one handle. So it's a torus. It has all the characters here. Why did you write times one handle? Um, because I made a mistake. Uh, Uh, it, should it should be times. It should be times, yes. Thanks. Yes, it should be times. Um, yes. Times one. Fine. Um, I'm glad someone picked up on that. Uh, I'm also going to, so this really took inspiration from uh, what uh, Douglas and Jeff and Steve did, which was to add these end of the world brains as nice models of black hole interiors. Um, and these are dynamical in the sense that I can decide whether or when I include them. And they come with some index that runs from 1 through to n. Um, so apart from this boundary condition z, which defines a circle, I have this boundary condition, which I'm going to write in this very suggestive notation, which inserts a boundary, which is an interval with an end of the world brain with index i in the past and j in the future. Um, so for example, uh, this. Um, this amplitude means I sum over all topologies that have one boundary, which is an interval with end of the world brains indices I1 and J1, another boundary I2 and J2, and one circular boundary. So here's my circular boundary. Here's one interval. Here's another interval. And this will carry some index. This will carry some index. And I'm also going to allow for little loops. They don't do a lot. But I could have loops of closed universes. Um, this is one contribution. And uh, I get this amplitude. So first of all, I get these delta functions because this end of the world brains always carry one index. So I need to match up indices between the two boundaries. Um, there's this, which is a topological uh, factor that comes from one handle and one boundary, or the character minus one. And n, because I have n species, I can sum over here. OK, so this is the sort of thing. Um, Computing the amplitudes is a sort of simple counting exercise, and it's not the interesting thing. So I'm going to go through it sort of very quickly, just to give you a flavor. Don't worry about following the details. But the basic reason why you can make everything very simple is that if you sum over any connected surface with a fixed set of boundary conditions, it always gives the same number, independent of what those boundaries are. Um, so OK, here's a few counting things. So I've got the, the hardler hawking state is the exponential of this number lambda, because I can have no closed universes, one closed universe, two closed universes, n closed universes, and that, in the usual way, I get the exponential of connected things. Every connected thing gives me a lambda. So this is the hardle hawking state. And then you can just sort of do this counting problem. Let's, OK, I'll skip it. So capital N is the number of species of these end of the world brains. Uh, I think Douglas called it K. I should have. I changed most of my notation to match Douglas, but I missed that one. Sorry. OK. Um, let's not worry about the counting, but um, the easy way to do the counting is to write a generating function. Um, so this sums up all the different contributions. Um, OK, I want to talk about more interesting things. But, so this is the answer. Let's not worry about it. Um, and I can write the answer like this. So I expand it in powers of little z. Uh, just do a Taylor expansion with these coefficients. And now I can interpret this as uh, an ensemble of some random variable z, which is distributed as a Poisson distribution with mean lambda. This was unexpected and magical and surprising, that this distribution has non-negative integer support. And if we think about what this z, z should be in a, a dual CFT, 
it would be trace e to the minus beta h, but there's no metric, there's no Hamiltonian in the boundary, so it's just the trace of one. It counts the dimension of the Hilbert space. So what I've got coming out is Hilbert spaces of non-negative integer dimension. That's unexpected amazing. I, okay, I don't have a great explanation for why that had to happen. Um, it's, it's, okay. it's to do with the fact that different boundaries don't talk to one another uh, in this model. Um, so that was kind of magical. Um, let's add these end of the world brains now. So I do a generating function that includes some auxiliary parameter tij for each of these possible boundaries. Similarly to before, you can do the summation. Let's not worry about the details. And I can write the answer like this, where I have the same probability distributions for, the, uh, for this partition function, if you like, z, um, multiplied by an amplitude for end of the world brains. And this amplitude for end of the world brains conditioned on the dimension of the Hilbert space in the dual language is given by this, this thing. Okay. I then found Google and Wikipedia. Apparently, this is a complex Wishard distribution, which meant nothing to me either. Uh, but you can write it like this. So what's this on the right-hand side? This looks a lot like the thing we had inside our expectation value, uh, as if we make this replacement where this sum is this expectation value. Everything else is a measure, and it's a Gaussian measure on these auxiliary variables psi ia that I've introduced. Uh, so that means that if I define my uh, overlap in terms of these auxiliary variables, then, and these variables, I select them independently at random from a Gaussian distribution with unit, uh, unit um, variance, uh, then that gives me the distribution of the tij. This has, a, again, a perfect interpretation uh, from the dual Hilbert space. It's that these uh, psi IAs are just the wave functions of my uh, boundary creating operators, end of the world brain creating operators, uh, in some orthonormal basis labeled by A. And that orthonormal basis has dimension z, which is a dimension of the Hilbert space. This is, again, kind of magical. Didn't quite believe that this could have happened when we first found it out. Um, so this, in particular, means that if I look at the rank of this matrix with probability 1, it's either n if I have, if the number of end of the world brains is fewer, is it smaller than the dimension, or it's the sort of maximal dimension z if the number of end of the world brains is uh, is larger than z. Okay, so this means that I have a, okay, in so much as I can have a unitary quantum mechanics when I don't have Hamiltonians, I've got a Hilbert space and a set of states, and they make a, uh, uh, an ensemble of consistent quantum mechanical theories. So that's cool, I think. So they have these integer dimensions. Uh, so somehow the gravitational path integral is smart enough to know about some detailed facts about unitarity. Um, okay, so let's talk about the Hilbert space, because that was the whole fun of this. Um, so it's this Fox, okay. Naively, you would think there's different sorts of closed universes I can have. I can have a closed, a closed universe, which is a circle, or I can have a closed universe, which is an interval between end of the world brains. Um, so uh, but this Fox space is, once I introduce this inner product and so forth, and start uh, projecting out the null states, this is just completely wrong. Um, so for example, this state, which I can think I can expand this in a polynomial, so this is zero boundaries plus some amplitude for one boundary plus some amplitude for two and so forth. Because if I plug in an integer here, I get one always, that's actually the same state as a hard Hawking state. And so forth. So, Hopefully this convinces you that I've got this huge number of states. So there's an integer number, so I can, I can take any states like these. Um, and in fact, so I can roughly speaking think of this Fox space as defined by all functions of Z, of some class, uh, of say real Z, but the actual physical Hilbert space is just functions on the integers. So it's way smaller in some sense. So you've thrown out a lot of states. So this map from the sort of naive what you would expect the Hilbert space to look like in a semi-classical setting to the physical Hilbert space, which is sort of projecting down to gauge invariant or gauge independent states, is really highly generate. It's throwing away a lot of states. Um, I probably have little time left. Yeah. I have time. Oh, okay. okay. 
Um, okay, and when does this uh, Fox space approximation fail? It fails in some sense when entropy bounds are saturated. So um, this means that I have some naive Hilbert space, which is sort of very, very large. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that happens inside black holes. When I have a huge volume inside an old black hole, semi-classically, I would think there's a huge amount of room for different states in there. Uh, but the Bekenstein Hawking formula tells me there just aren't that many states. And there's, some, there's an entropy bound to tell me how much information there is. That is exactly when the, this projection that throws out these uh, non-gauge invariant states is, uh, is, is showing this massive degeneracy. Uh, okay, so let's talk about old black holes. Um, so I was talking about Hilbert spaces before of just closed universes, but an obvious generalization is I can decide to put my sort of cut where I'm inserting complete sets of states, so that cut passes through one of my asymptotic boundaries. Now the past has some complete boundary, this Z of J1, but it also has some sort of half boundary with some open ends on the, on the asymptotic ADS boundary. If I were to talk about this in usual ADS CFT, I would say that the boundary has some, this is some state that I'm preparing, let's say. Some state psi of J S, S for South Pole, so this is maybe a sphere. So I prepare some state with a path integral on the South Pole. This is like a thermofield double, maybe. Um, so I've got one place that I'm preparing a state with sources, and then I can insert some number of things. Everything else is basically the same. So this, this notation is potentially confusing. I've got one inner ket that I'm interpreting as uh, that I'd like to interpret as a state in a dual CFT ensemble. And I've got this sort of outer ket, which is telling me that this is a state in the bulk semi-classical Hilbert space of baby universes, now with the boundary. OK. Uh, so I can write a black, an old black hole, for example, like this. Uh, it's a sum over things where I turn on some sources in the past. So these sources might involve time evolution, coupling to a bath, and so forth. And this R, this R is the bath system. And, okay, it might look like a, a sort of fairly special state, but really anything I do where I think in the CFT I'm doing an evolution coupled to a bath, I can write like this. So this IR, I'm going to choose it to be an orthonormal basis of this auxiliary radiation system. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing as we, I learned from Jeff and Douglas and Steve, uh, and do this simple model and... Uh, in this case, I've got this psi i, which is a, a state that, is, uh, that has one physical boundary, which is creating an end-of-the-world brain state. And I want to think about this thing. So on the boundary, this is the state at late times of an old black hole. And i is an index that tells me what the possible internal states of the black hole are. And the number of internal states is potentially much, much larger than the sort of thermal entropy that I want on the boundary system. OK. Um, so in this model, I can now explicitly compute the radiation density matrix. This is a calculation that was uh, described by or something very similar to a calculation described by Douglas, where you trace out the, uh, um, you, okay, you trace out the baby universes, and you're just left with a radiation state. And we can compute what this state looks like. It's the amplitude of psi i, psi j, one boundary, uh, one interval between brains i and j, which is proportional to delta ij. It's the maximally mixed state. It has rank n, it has entropy, e to the, uh, entropy log n, which could be as big as I like. So this is a problem. This is, this is information loss. OK. Information has been lost. I can do something different. I can instead prepare it in one of these special alpha states. So this means I add some superposition of boundaries that is designed so that this creates, thanks, one. This creates, uh, this is an eigenstate of all these, uh, uh, of all these sort of CFT operators where I insert extra boundaries. Uh, and now the density matrix, if I compute it, instead of being this amplitude sort of ensemble average psi ij, if you like, uh, is psi ij in this specific ensemble. It's the, in other words, it's the eigenvalue of the operator that inserts one of these boundaries. OK. And that, if n is very large, that has rank z alpha. It has 
In, in other words, it exactly saturates the maximum entropy that I can have. So this is a page curve. If I dial up n, increase, 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 the entropy goes up and up and up and up, and then it saturates. But it didn't work. So it didn't work in the hardle hawking state, but it did work in the alpha state. OK. Um, OK, so I'll say what that means later. Um, and in generality, we can prove something just using reflection positivity, uh, reflection positivity that says that if I prepare any state like this in the most general circumstance and I compute the entropy of the radiation, it's always less than uh, the entropy of some um, uh, the, the thermal entropy. And this thermal entropy is computed from uh, Legendre transform of the partition function. So this is, this is something on the right-hand side, roughly speaking, computed from a circle, which is how I would compute the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. This is what I would do by looking at an eternal black hole and looking at area over 4G. That's the right-hand side. The left-hand side is something I did just in semi-classical gravity by really uh, coupling two systems and letting one evaporate into the other. And I compare these at sort of matching energies. And I have this bound. Um, so the first thing to emphasize about this bound is this is only true if I started in an alpha state. It fails dramatically if I start in the hardle hawking state. Uh, and um, what else did I want to say about it? <laughs> OK. Uh, and the second thing to say is that this is, uh, this is the page curve, essentially. It's a bound that implies that the entropy can't go up forever. It has to start coming down again in an old black hole. Um, and it's true not just on average, which was what the wormhole calculations that have been talked about already show, uh, but it shows shot by shot in every single member of the ensemble it's true. OK, so how do we interpret the, this in now for the black hole information problem? Um, so Hawking calculation was absolutely correct. What he was doing was computing the entropy of this state rho r, uh, which was basically a thermal density matrix. But from the ensemble point of view, this is like an average of all possible density matrices. And the entropy of the average state is not the same thing as the average of the entropies. So the ryutaki nagi formula computes the average of the entropies. Hawking's calculation looks like it gets information loss because uh, the final state of the radiation is entangled with all the baby universes. This is not a new observation. This is explained very nicely in a paper of uh, Polchinski and Strominger in about 94 or something. And uh, OK, this is, this is nothing new. Um, so information really is lost. If I form a black hole from a pure state and I start with the baby universes in the hardle hawking state, the radiation that comes out is in a mixed state because it's entangled with the baby universes. But information is not lost in any useful way, any meaningful way, because if I try to verify that in my lab, I could never uh, actually verify this mixed state. Uh, so this was emphasized in the context of these random couplings by Coleman, uh, but uh, it's also true in this black hole context. Um, what do I want to say? OK, I'm probably out of time, more or less. One minute, thanks. OK. OK. Um, let's see. OK, so why is this thing true? Um, it's because when I make an observation, I end up with my brain decohering into branches where I'm learning more and more about alpha. So when I take, make two observations, the first observation and the second observation are correlated. So for example, if I form a black hole, collect the radiation, form an identical black hole, create the radiation, and measure a swap operator, if this was a mixed state, the swap operator does not necessarily give me one. If it was a pure state, it always gives me one. Uh, but the mixed states that I get in both cases, so I do get a mixed state in both cases, but they're correlated with one another. And that correlation means that I always verify unitarity. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, and because we've got this massive gauge invariance, what goes on inside a black hole is very ambiguous. There's lots of gauge choices I can make and lots of potential semi-classical descriptions of the same identical physics. And I like to say that everyone's a winner here, because if you have a favorite 
resolution of the information paradox, you could probably fix a gauge in which it's true. So there are room for all of these things to be true. Information is lost, information is not lost. There are remnants and fuzzballs, a smooth interior and a firewall, and the final state proposal, and non-violent non-locality. <laughs> it may all be true. This is the part I'm less certain about. <laughs> okay, and it's not even clear if there are gauge yeah, <laughs> 